Uh, Is that saving fun over the summer, Mia? Yeah. Uh, well, I don't have the box that um, this is a lot closer, so I think it should be good. It's got the no, light. I'm talking about the microphone in there. Oh, um, it couldn't hurt. I mean, I think it's pretty close, but it certainly wouldn't hurt anything. It's just the light. Oh, right. So we're like, we're like, right you turn off the station. Maybe, um, the light from up there is like, you need light out? But you get that, that one? I don't know if it's true, you get just that one. There you go. Is that one? Oh, that's much better. Yeah. Can you guys see okay up there? Well, you can yeah. see the people. Uh, you can reflect the light on the table. Yeah, that's true. You guys can move up. You don't, you don't have to sit at the table if you don't want to. You can pull your chairs around if you like, or. Uh, is this you guys? Yeah, that well, that's my seat right there. But these seats will be here on the corner. Anyone want to move up? Shy people. All right, can we get started? Ben, are we all, all right. set? Do you have the cameras rolling? All right, well, first of all, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm sure that I speak for everyone uh, when I say that we're all excited to hear from our two guest attorneys, Richard Bora and Sinead Laperty. Um, so before they start their presentation, I'd just like to give you a little background information on them. Um, I was able to see their resumes, and it was very impressive, so I'm just going to give you like a synopsis. <laughs> um, so both Mr. Bora and Ms. Laperty attended Quinnipiac University School of Law. They graduated together in 2006. Um, Shanae has her own firm in Connecticut and Stanford. And she also works alongside Mr. Bora at his firm. She's up counsel there. Um, she specializes in commercial litigation, professional liability, and business counsel. And she's also a lecturer on medical and legal risk management issues. Um, as for Mr. Gora, he has his firm also in Stanford. Uh, they represent investment advisors in connection with state and securities exchange commission enforcement actions. Um, they specialize in business counsel, business litigation, white collar and securities litigation, investment management counsel, and employment counsel. Richard Gora's firm has advised companies all over the world, including the UAE, UK, Australia, Vietnam, and China on business and contracting issues. Um, and then one thing that I found awesome was that he advised the founder of a technology company who had a successful exit upon purchase by Yahoo for approximately $50 million. So I thought that was very impressive. Um, so Mr. Gore and Mr. Ferdy are here to address crucial legal issues facing in the process of launching, financing, and growing a venture. They will share with us their personal experience in advising startups. Please give a warm welcome to Mr. Gore and Mr. Ferdy. Thank you so much, but I really appreciate it. We're really happy to be here. Um, Rich and I are classmates from Quinnipiac Law School. We graduated in 2006. Let me check one of you say a couple of Sorry, go ahead. Uh, sorry is, it not, is it not rolling? Are we rolling? Yeah, we're rolling. Oh, okay. Uh, it, it's all good. I just wanted to yeah. thank you for oh, uh, joining us here at the College of Business, the University of New Haven. Uh, entrepreneurship is not, uh, it's not about economics. Uh, entrepreneurship is much broader than economics. Uh, we talked about this in the last hour. Entrepreneurship is the fastest area of, uh, of uh, business education right now. So if you're excited about entrepreneurship and you're not a business major, if you're excited about entrepreneurship and you're not an econ major, feel welcome here. Because the work we're doing in building a center for entrepreneurship and innovation, led by uh, uh, Dr. Marx, uh, is, uh, is cross-disciplinary by its very nature. One of the things I took away from our conversation earlier is our guests are more than happy to go off script. So uh, they want to provide to you what it is that you want. I told them that you're among our best students. So if something pops into your head, if you have a question, they're ready for you. All right, enjoy. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So I just wanted to impress upon you that a liberal arts education is so important. Take a bunch of classes, figure out what you want to do. I majored in biology with a minor in music and went to law school. So <laughs> you can go any direction you want to. And I understand some or many of you want to have your own startups. If you want to start up now, go right ahead. You can, you can do it while you're in school or if you're just something this is what, what you want to do after you graduate. We're here to provide um, some advice 
um, some basic steps on what you need to take in order to start your own startup and um, basically just advise you and, and what you, you want to know and what you would like to hear from us. So at any time, feel free to interrupt with any questions. And, and um, as we said, we're, we're happy to go off script. We do have a PowerPoint presentation, but we're not uh, married to it. Yeah, we, we, uh, we did the PowerPoint presentation over the past two weeks, and then we had a meeting about an hour ago. We decided that everything we wanted to talk about is nothing that we're going to talk about today. Um, but we may still do it. Yeah, we still may do it. But you know, we're really not going to get into what we have here. Um, one thing that I just wanted to start off with is, even though we're lawyers, you know, Sinead and I worked at big firms prior to starting our own firm. So while we're lawyers, we're entrepreneurs and right as well. Since we, you know, we, we gave up very high paying jobs um, with reputable firms. I worked for the best firm in the, in the state. Um, you know, Sinead has great experience working for very good firms as well. And we gave that, all that up to kind of start our own firm, start our own practice. Um, give up the the certainty of getting a paycheck every two weeks in exchange for doing your own thing, um, getting to meet people, working your own hours, and having the flexibility that comes with a startup. So, you know, it's not a startup in the technical sense of the term because we're not creating a product, we're providing services, um, services that are specialized based on our degree. And I think that's going to kind of be a theme that runs through what we're talking about today. Um, Sinead and I have represented you know, hundreds if not thousands of startups. We understand that the, the issues upon formation, um, uh, financial information, uh, getting funding, the legal risk, the business risk as well. And um, I, I think what we want to do here is kind of structure this discussion so that we can give you some of the, of, of, of the good stories and the bad stories and some of the practical experiences that we've had with, with clients from, you know, day one until they sell to a company like Yahoo for uh, a nice chunk of change. So um, I'm going to skip over for the moment this next slide. Uh, I may get into it after we've gone through some of our examples so you can see how they apply in the real world. Um, so we'll get back to this. If anyone has any particular questions about these topics going forward, we're, we're fully prepared to answer uh, those questions. But just moving forward to more real-life, um, non-abstract type examples, let's start with Facebook. I'm sure, or I, I wonder if, if, how many of you have seen the movie Social Network? Okay, so the majority. Um, obviously, you know, Facebook says that it's a work of fiction and it's Hollywood's interpretation of what happened, but it, it gives a very good and entertaining storyline and a lot of the facts regarding the legal disputes are actually pretty, pretty right on point. Um, so just to refresh your memory of the movie, there are three issues I wanted to talk about um, that Facebook faced. And these issues are, are ones that could have been corrected <coughs> at the very start of the venture. So one of them is, you probably know the, the Winklevoss uh, brothers, Cameron and Tyler, and they alleged trade secret misappropriation. They had a uh, an idea for a website called, initially called Harvard Connection. The name was later changed to Connect You, and as the story goes, Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg, um, allegedly stole the idea. So uh, Zuckerberg initially formed an LLC in Florida, which is a little unusual given that he wanted to create this huge tech um, company. And actually, a, a corporate structure would have been uh, incorporating it would have been a, a better idea. Because later on down the road, um, although you could easily convert it, he was having a rift with Eduardo Sabrin. And he couldn't get him to sign off on the reform reformation. So, Zuckerberg wanted to um, to incorporate as a corporation so he could get funding from venture capitalists, but Eduardo said no. So Zuckerberg had to use his own family funds to continue the operation. Uh, he, he, he ended up creating a new company called the Facebook.com and then incorporated it in Delaware and then acquired the old company. But obviously there were issues along the way. To, Ed, Eduardo Sabrin stock purchase agreement. Um, I'll just give you a, a little bit of a timeline. In September, actually September 27, 2004, Peter Thiel formally acquired 9% of the new company with a convertible note worth 500,000. Before the transaction, Facebook ownership was divided between Zuckerberg with 65%, Sabrin with 30%, and Moskowitz with 5%. 
After the transaction, the new company was divided between Zuckerberg with 40%, Saverin with 24%, and Moskowitz with 16%, and Thiel with 9%. Uh, the rest, about 20%, went to an options pool for future employees. And from there, a good chunk of equity went to Edwater's replacement, um, the Facebook.com's new COO, Sean Parker, who's co-founder of Napster. So, I mean, to, to uh, Eduardo, it seems fine. You know, his, his percentage is just reduced by a little bit. Uh, so he, he signed off on that agreement, not knowing that a month later, um, this new shareholder agreement allotted him 3 million shares of common stock in the new company. And he handed over all relevant intellectual property, turned over his voting rights to Mark Zuckerberg, and Mark became Facebook's sole director. So then, another month later, Mark caused, on uh, January 7, 2005, Mark caused Facebook to issue 9 million shares of common stock in the new company. He took 3.3 million shares for himself and gave 2 million to Sean Parker and 2 million to Dustin Moskowitz. This share uh, issuance instantly diluted, diluted Edward, Eduardo's share in the company to 20, from 24% to below 10%. And he has no intellectual property rights, he has no management, he has no control, and um, he filed a lawsuit. So uh, the reason why we picked Facebook is important. Everyone knows Facebook. Everyone kind of knows the players. But it kind of provides a good framework for the discussion today. So there's a lot of terms that you may have heard for the first time that you yeah. may just just, uh, <laughs> just uh, read to you. Um, dilution. Yeah, dilution, right? So I'm putting the, the overview slide back on. And the, there's a lot of issues and, and, and um, important decisions that are made when you decide to, to form a startup. And I think the, this kind of highlights what are the important issues and discussion points among founders, formation, uh, equity, funding, employment, and, and IP. And um, I think what we wanted to do was use Facebook as a background to kind of go through each of these issues. So formation, um, when you just, when you come up with a great idea, um, all of my founder clients think that they have the best idea in the world. And um, sometimes I listen to them and I, I read their pitch decks and I think to myself, this is not a great idea. But I never want to burst that bubble, but I'll help them go through because what do I know? I'm just a lawyer. Uh, for example, I have one client who came to me with a you know, 15, 20 page pitch deck. Beautiful. I mean, it, it, nice colors. They had a professional graphics design artist put this together. And it was a it was an idea for a floating restaurant, right? That can uh, that, that was going to be venued in Chicago, Boston Harbor, Miami, and LA. And they were going to charge like Thirty thousand dollars a night to rent this, you know, it was like it was like a floating dock, and they had a space for a bar, they had a space for a DJ, and they thought it was the great the greatest idea ever. And I was going through the pitch deck, and I saw that they were their revenue projections showed that they were going to make X dollars per day for three hundred sixty five days a year. And I said, well, did you take into account weather or anything like that? And they Season, and they didn't. Right, yes, right. it's a seasonal business. I mean, you can't have an outdoor restaurant on the water in Boston. 365 days a year. You can't do it in Miami because there may be a hurricane. <laughs> um, so they didn't build in risk. And um, part of a, a lawyer's job and a business advisor's job is to kind of walk through founders and, and talk about these issues because I know when I deal with investors, if an investor, if one of my investor clients were to get that pitch deck, you know, this beautiful pitch deck that looks really nice, really nice colors, and they flipped through the second or third page and they saw revenue projections based on 365 days, that's it. The, you know, they're never gonna look at that again. Um, so you know, these are, are, are pretty much the biggest central issues that you need to think about when you're forming a startup. Formation, there's, there's essentially two forms of entities that you can use for a startup, either a limited liability company or, or a corporation, and there's pros and cons uh, to each. Um, but as long as you're thinking about um, exit strategies, uh, funding, employment issues, IP, I think that um, if, if cash is an issue, then you, you will create, you'll use a, an LLC as the initial form of the entity. But what we've learned um, in representing investors, uh, as well as startups, is the funding issue kind of drives the form of the entity. Um, you know, we just got back from Silicon Valley for two weeks, uh, visiting with a couple of clients, um, and any investor, whether it be um, seed, um, throwing a blank here, seed, um, angel. angel, right, right. And, 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 and private equity or VC, are going to want to invest in a, in a corporation that's a C corporation. It's, it's a, uh, an aspect of the tax code that the corporation gets taxed. 
So funding drives a lot of the decisions. And what I tell clients, having represented clients on exits, meaning they've sold their interest in the company to an investor and kind of got that big cash, cash payday is, you need to kind of drive every decision to your, your exit, your payday. And um, although there may be more financial impacts early on by going with C Corporation, it kind of exudes this level of sophistication to investors, C, you know, angels early on, and that you're doing things that um, are in compliance with the law and you have the, the background and the, and the backstop of fiduciary concepts that are attendant to corporations. And, and, and a few other reasons why a venture capitalist is gonna to wanna to go with the C corporation is because you know you, you incorporate in Delaware, um, that's what most corporations do. The law is really well settled in Delaware, so there's really um, no need to do due diligence for the investors when they're investing in your company. Um, they're very comfortable with Delaware. Uh, a lot of companies uh, incorporate in Delaware, so they're happy, makes them comfortable. As Rich mentioned, um, and then there's no talk of reincorporation um, when a business needs to raise more money. It's already done. Um, an LLC is, is not suitable for businesses financed by venture capital funds because, as Rich talked about, tax restrictions on the funds tax exempt partners. Um, so those are just that's one of the considerations when you're first starting a company. Do you want to make it an LLC or do you want to make it a, 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 a corporation? Um, if you want to go through a couple of the steps that you need to take, um, if you want to file an LLC or a corporation, you could do that. I don't know how close anyone is to filing uh, filing for a startup. Is anyone thinking about um, wanting to start their own company really soon? Yes? No? Because <laughs> there are certain paperwork requirements and, and things that need to be filed. One of the things you want to think about, um, just as a basic idea, is the name of your company. Um, that, that's important for trademark reasons as well. So what you can do if, if you're in the very early stages of thinking about an idea is just go on to, you know, if you're going to do in Connecticut, go on to the Connecticut um, Secretary of State website and search for names and see if there's any matches. You can also go to um, one of the government sites and, and check to see if there's any trademarks. Um, but make sure that if you want to do business in other states, check those states as well. But just checking the name on the Secretary of State is, is not sufficient. You also need to do your due diligence and see for other companies. You don't want to infringe on, on their trademarks as well. Yeah, so uh, you know, all of these issues kind of roll into each other. And um, when you're dealing with the formation issue, a, a difficult discussion you're going to have to have among your founders, uh, assuming that there's more than one, is what's the breakup in the equity ownership of the company? And I've seen so many times um, where Everyone is just so happy-go-lucky early on, early on in the process and thinking this is going to pan out so great. There's no need for us to have a discussion about, um, you know, who controls what, who's going to be the CEO, who's going to be the CFO, and um, people just roll with things. And thinking, it's also a, it's a sensitive issue. Yeah, very sensitive. You don't issue. really want to talk about, it, especially when you have all the passion, you have all the excitement to then introduce money into it because maybe you're afraid that your other co-founder or co-founders might not want to continue with the process if they realize that, hey, you want 51%, which means that you have more control, or you think that your value is is, is greater than theirs. Um, but it, it's important to, to establish that at the very beginning. Otherwise, you're, you're just, it just spells trouble down the road. And, and a lot of these startups are, are college students and, and really young people who don't realize the ramifications um, of doing this. So get it, get it in writing. Um, and even if you're raising uh, money from family or friends, get everything in, in writing and, and treat them as as if they're a, you know a, a an investor who's a stranger. Yeah. So I have a client who's a Silicon Valley company does about a hundred million dollars of business, and they they have a software solution that they've developed over the course of a couple of years, uh, I think two or three years, and there are three founders. I mean. These are best friends since like kindergarten. They've known each other, grammar school, elementary school, high school, middle school, college. Just have been with each other their entire lives. Came up with this great idea, kind of took off. They had, I think, uh, 100 employees as of April of this year. And then they went out to go get some cash from an investor. Private equity fund came in and gave them 10, $15 million. They got a great valuation from that. And as a result of getting that investment, the, the investor wanted a board, a seat on the board. 
and uh, a board seat is a very valuable thing. A board controls the big picture decisions for the company. And um, you know the three founders were just so closely knit that the investor saw that and he wanted to capitalize on that because his interest is monetize the investment as quickly as possible and get a return on the investment. So he, drew, he, he kind of drove a wedge between one of the, uh, with, with one of the founders who was the CEO at the time. It was his idea, he was the guy with the tech experience, he was the one that knew how to write the code for the company. And without him in the early stages of the company, just like Zuckerberg, there would be no company, there would be no product. He was instrumental to the success of the business early on. And while they had the discussion on formation and equity, allocation, purchasing, investing, what they did was they agreed that no one would own all the stock of the company outright in the beginning. They would be subject to a certain vesting provision, meaning as time passes, each month that passes, you'll get an additional award of equity that'll kind of ramp you up to when the three years or two years expires. So when the when the investor came in, he wanted that client out, that, that founder out. So after I think two or three months of discussions to try to get, get him out, they just fired him. And I, he was entitled to, I think it was like 20, 25% of the company. And because of the vesting provision and the, and the early on discussions that he had with his founders, he essentially lost all of his interest in the company and he got kicked out. So something that was worth hundreds of millions of dollars and that he created and that it was his idea and his IP that he transferred to, to the company, just like Zuckerberg did, um, he lost. And um, I've seen so many times where friends get together, you know, all time classmates, and everyone thinks that things are going to go well forever, but I've never seen a situation like that ever happen. So it's, it's very important just to have that discussion um, and talk about what happens when things go bad. Uh, what happens if there's a, a, an issue? What happens if there's a dispute? Or someone wants to leave. Or someone wants to leave. On easy terms, you know, yeah. not not because there was a fight or anything. They have other obligations, or they're not as invested in in the company as, as they thought they would be. They're not passionate about it. Right, and, and the worst thing for a founder is to you know share a company equally among three, four, five, six people, and then someone leaves, and then their their equity stake is owned by the by the founder that left, and they're not adding anything, and right. they're not adding any more value to the company. But they're, they're collecting the money, and everyone else is doing all the work. Right, right. So that that adds a lot of animosity and resentment among the founder team, and um, I think the only thing to get out of this portion of the overview is. Have those difficult discussions early on. I mean, it's it's that's the most important thing. If you can come up with an easy way to have a divorce with your business partners, and you have it papered up, right? And you sign it, and everyone agrees. So it's, it's a prenup. Yeah, you, it's ha a prenup. you have to have the prenup. Unfortunately, um, you may not want to do it, but it'll help with litigation. Um, you know, and, and in my situation, sort of yeah, cut you off. No I mean, these are friends that have been friends for 20, 30 years, and now they've lost. A business partner and a friend. Um, he doesn't talk to them anymore. They don't talk to him anymore. And you're losing, you know, both a friend and, and a colleague. Um, you know, they've spent Christmases and holidays, best men at each other's weddings, and that's all gone because, because you know, greed is greed. Um, Rich, how many founders were involved with that case you were talking about? Is that three? Three. That's really interesting that Rich said this. I hadn't actually talked to Rich about this before, but when I was preparing this presentation. Um, last night and the past couple weeks, um, I wanted to pick out a few high profile cases for you. And it wasn't until today when I was reviewing the PowerPoint presentation that the three cases I picked, Facebook being one, there's three founders. And I don't know if it's a coincidence, but now this is the fourth situation where there's been an issue with three founders. And what happens, it's a, a human psychology thing, I think. And this is my own personal opinion. So if you want to have three people, go right ahead. But I, I don't know. I feel like um, sometimes two people side against one at some point or the other. And we'll get into the two other examples of three founders having an issue. Um, this is Snapchat. I picked this because... Which just today decided to go public. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, you guys are a lot younger. I, I do know about Snapchat. I'm not on it. But um, just for those who, of you who don't know, this is a company, it was originally called Peekaboo. Maybe you heard about it in that sense. It's a Beach California based mobile app and it uh, allows users to send disappearing photos. Have Snapchat here? Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's a lot. Um, so, anyway, and uh, just for the people who don't know, 
More than 400 million photos are being sent on Snapchat each day, um, which is crazy. And its CEO, Evan Spiegel, he reportedly rebuffed an acquisition offers from Facebook and Google for as much as $4 billion. So there's a lot of money at stake here. I don't think Rich knows about Snapchat. No, I do. I just, I just they're trying to raise $4 billion now and getting a We're, we're going to sign up billion. after this presentation and send disappearing photos to each other. Um, so anyway, <laughs> Reggie Brown uh, was one of the three co-founders start this mobile app, he's at Stanford, with two of his Kappa Sigma fraternity brothers. They're all pals here. And so it's, um, so Evan, Evan and Reggie Brown, who's the future plaintiff, the litigant, started this sort of together. And they actually helped each other in the hunt for a coder. So they actually didn't have a coder, they just had the idea. So they found Bobby Murphy, and Bobby Murphy was a frat brother. And um, then, for whatever reason, I don't know what personal issues went on, but Brown uh, alleges that the co-founders, the other two, Bobby and Evan, secretly created a new company, cut him out, and leaving Spiegel with 60% of Snapchat and Murphy with 40%. So it was his idea, and, and pretty much they admit to it, but we'll get into that. There's still position testimony. <laughs> um, so, there were problems that came out in the deposition that show why you need to be careful at the early stages. And I'll just give you two examples. This is public knowledge. Um, I found it online. They're videotaped depositions. So there was one automated email from Facebook to Brown, Brown's a litigant, and it read, Bobby Murphy tagged you in peekaboo under employers. So basically, Bobby saying, hey, you're one of the employers. So how can they deny that he's involved with a company if he's hiding him as an employer? The second email that came out, and, and by the way, before this email came out, they questioned um, Bobby Murphy about it. He, he denied it. And then when he was shown it, oh, yeah, yeah, I did send that. But I don't really know what Facebook meant by employer, is what he said. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, no. Facebook, okay. Facebook, the automated message came from Facebook. And I, I guess on Facebook, it labels, you know, you can say who your friends are, who your friends are. Um, who's an employee these employers. So then there was another email from Spiegel, and he was he sent an email to, his, to, I don't know if it was a friend, but anyway, he said, I just built an app with two friends of mine, parentheses, certified bros. So at the deposition, Spiegel was asked, who are those two friends? He admitted it was Bobby and Reggie. So just be really careful with, with emails back and forth at the beginning, um, you know, saying what the founder's roles are, um, I mean, it's hard to say that in hindsight because when you're starting a business and you have founders, you should all be on the same page. But this happened really early on. It's just something to keep in mind is either someone who might be on the outs or someone who is going to who's planning on running the company. Doesn't that wear down the trust though that you need at the beginning? I mean, you're with friends that are. And, you know, it's like asking your fiance for it's a, like a prenup. A prenup you know? yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's only business. It's just business. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, that's hard to cut it. I mean, I, I can tell you, you know, in, in doing hundreds of, of these type of with clients, more that's agreed to early on in the process is just that much better. Um, if, if you're on the same page on every single material fact or what could possibly go wrong, you're going to be that much better off at the end. Not only between founders, but between investors. An investor comes in, an investor wants to know that the founders are acting in a business-like manner and that their agreement is, is drawn up in, 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 you know, in whatever shareholders agreement needs to be there. And you're kind of exuding that sense of professionalism to an investor when you're pitching them. And they want to see all the documents. They want to see that you have the articles of incorporation, the stockholder agreement, bylaws, um, board resolutions, because the investor is investing in you in, in as much as the and, investor is investing in the idea. Yeah, and it's a very valid point. What, what investors do look at is the trust. Um, and are the founder, founders equally invested? So is one of them working in another job? Um, various other things. What, what property interests do they have? Have they donated to the company? So trust is huge. 
time. I, I don't know. It, it's, a, it's a tricky one, but from a lawyer's perspective, right, you can say the same thing with, you know, family and friends who offer you money. Um, should you not put that in writing because you don't want to offend them? But oftentimes there are situations where down the road some uncle who, who gave $5,000 and now the company's worth X amount, they come and they say, oh, I, I was really involved in the start of the company. Now I want, you know, $30 million. What happened to the Texas handshake? I mean, would that count for something? Um, I mean, they, that, you know, in this Snapchat. That's going to result in the Texas brawl. <laughs> that's a showdown. Um, that is, a, you know, in the Snapchat case, they did look at verbal agreements. But, yeah. you know, in law, verbal agreements don't hold as much water as a, as a written agreement. And in Connecticut. They're enforceable in the same way, but it's just going to cost you that much more to go to court and say, and you know, I said this, she said this. And then he said, she said, and it's just. Wouldn't you say your role as an attorney is to actually stand in to create the trust among each other, get documented, and be the fall guy or gal to say it's, we're requiring this because right. we want to have that investment in the future? Yeah, I always tell clients, um, founders or you know when I'm dealing with investors always blame me right <laughs> if, if 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 there's an issue that needs to be done or the a, judge or a judge yeah, <laughs> or a document that needs to be signed you know it's very easy to hide behind your lawyer and just say my lawyer is crazy he doesn't know what he's talking about but he needs me to sign this for whatever reason yeah. and then you know what are the other founders going to say well you know, get a new lawyer <laughs> that like, well, and, and who do you represent in, during the formation who oh well, I mean that's a that's a delicate issue, right? <laughs> um, you know, in, 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 well, in my I, practice. I, 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 go right, ahead. No, no, you go ahead. Right. So in my practice, what I like to do is have the discussion with with all three founders at the same time and, and, and identify to them that I'm representing them individually and collectively. And to the extent that they ever have a conflict with each other at this early stage, and I can't represent any of them, and I'd have to back off because I've created a, an issue and a dispute between my clients, and I know things about one that I – would have to say to the other. And then when, in, in these startup situations, once that's all done and resolved, then I get waivers from each client so that I can also represent the company, which in my financial interest is always the better thing to do. Um, but what I, was, what I was getting at is th these early discussions have ramifications early on in the process, and especially when you're gonna sell your company to get the big payday, um, that's where you wanna have all your I's dotted and your T's crossed because you gotta literally go to all your investors and say, you know, here are all my documents, take a look at these. And they just want to make sure that all the right documents that they typically see are always going to be there. Um, and um, one issue, one other issue that kind of sparked my attention is if you don't have these discussions, there may be an, uh, a situation where one of your founders remains on a cap table. And the cap table is a document that just identifies who the owners of the company are and what the percentage ownership is, uh, is, is in the company. And you can imagine that when you're talking to an investor and they look at the cap table and it's you know lists everyone's name there's a little parenthesis that says founder and they get to the last founder line and they're like well where's this guy what is he at and then you're gonna have that difficult discussion with an investor and you know each question leads to another question well what happened with, with what happened with this founder um, how did you resolve it why wasn't there an agreement and these are discussions you don't want to have you know, right because the investors are so choosy in particular yeah. to begin with especially venture capitalists because you know they're in the business of doing these deals, and they don't have time for you. They want you to come prepared, everything done, no issues with the founders. They don't. They just don't have time for that. But you know, as you're saying, you know, uh, both of you about trust and, and who do you represent. You really, at the very beginning, there shouldn't be adverse interests um, because I think I feel like that defeats the whole purpose of, the, of going forward with the company. That, that's just in my opinion. What, what do you think? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> compensation the, the, I have. There, there are times. There are times. That's uh, completely okay. okay. That's completely I've okay. taken a lot of equity. <laughs> <laughs> How else are you going to get paid? Because it, you know, start us up. Start us up. We'll, we'll find we'll out. See, we'll see. Right. right. <laughs> but does that ever create a conflict of interest? Yeah. So what I what I tell clients when that when there's an offer to bring me on um, to, to compensate me for equity is. Uh, I can't advise you on this. You should go out and get another lawyer, and you have to talk about this with someone else because I, I'm acting in my own self-interest right now. And if you want to compensate me with an equity interest, um, we need to kind of have this barrier up right now. We need to kind of stop doing everything else because I'm there's a conflict. Um, so 
you need to recognize these that, that conflicts may exist between your advisors, the founders, your attorneys, your accountants. And if that ever comes up, you need to really step back because a lot of times when there's a conflict um, that arises, it's going to create more issues down the road. Um, I've also had um, issues about cap table management. So cap table is a very important thing. CEOs of companies, CFOs spend a lot of time simply looking at a spreadsheet to see who owns the company, what type of equity uh, equity or um, derivative interest they have in the company. Derivatives, I'm talking about options and warrants, um, options and warrants, and uh, convertible instruments as well, debt equity. And what they want to do is they want to manage the cap table so that when you're trying to raise money through angels, seeds, private equity, BC, and series ABC, that the founders collectively retain control uh, in the company at the board level or a stockholder level. My general rule is your advisors and the founders are doing well if you can maintain control after the second round. So you'll have, you know, the seed comes in, angel comes in, a series A, which is you know big institutional money, and then series B. If, that, if after that series B round, you can retain control of the company at a board level and on a, as a stockholder level, then you're doing something really well and you spent a lot of time um, managing the cap table. When I say managing cap table, it's understanding how much equity you're giving out and what effect that has on your personal holdings and the, the collective founder holdings, um, um, what, what, what that will have. Because once you lose control of the company, then it's not yours anymore. And you need to kind of create a, you know, a huddle, huddle's been a term that's coming out recently a lot of the news, um, you know, create a, create a pack of people that are like-minded, that are on your side, that are gonna vote with you all along, because once you lose that, then the company's no longer yours. And part of my practice also is litigation. Uh, we do a lot of thick stakes litigation, and my bigger cases have been around the issue of whether, whether or not, or, or who has control. Uh, because if you have control of the company, then you can vote someone off the board as a stockholder. Um, a, a, the board votes for the officers of the company, the C, CEO, COO, CFO, CIO. And if you no longer have those votes, then they can literally oust you, which is what happened to my client, who was the, essentially the founder, the creator of the technology. So going through and understanding the, um, the mechanics of how a certain type of equity or debt interest that you're giving out to either an employee, an advisor, someone else as an officer is going to have on the controlling uh, group is, is very important. Right. And and in most cases, you don't want to give out a board seat unless that person can add some sort of strategic value for you or can have introduce you to different relationships that will build your business. So that's one of the, a common investor request to say, okay, I'll have a board seat and the person doesn't know any better than they give a board seat. Um, when they're not getting really anything in exchange for that. Um, and then also investors are going to ask for informational rights. So they want to know what's going on in your business and they may ask for, um, and they're contractual, so this would be in a, in a contract. And they'll ask for periodic updates. Um, monthly is acceptable, if, but if you have an investor who's wanting a weekly update or a monthly budget, that's way too much of an overreach. You don't want to agree to that because the person is micromanaging you and it takes so much time to actually have to do a status up update every week. Um, so that person is going to be um, uh, a diva perhaps um, and <laughs> is gonna cause other trouble down the road. You know, I, I can also share with you that you know, owning my own business and having to pay for employees and thinking about the future, I mean, a lot of my time gets spent on administrative tasks and that's just huge time, time killer yeah it's it's miserable sending out bills it, doing invoices doing tax stuff at the end of the year and what you will find as a as a startup or a small business owner is you need to be smart about your time I have one client who's located in the UK who has a medical device type of solution and uh, he's always concerned about my my fees so what he does is he'll send me an email and say rich you know can you review this non-disclosure agreement or this other type of agreement i've made the comments already i've added the language in for you too can you just bless this and he wants to do that because he's, he thinks he's saving money but i think it's just very short-sighted because then i need to go through and kind of erase what he's put in and kind of think of where what his mind's at just never wants to have, unnecessary yeah, work. never wants to have phone calls because he's concerned about that type of expense for him and I keep telling him at the end of the day, you're creating more work for yourself because you're spending the time on something that you're not an expert on 
you're not you're a doctor, a, you know, a, a medical doctor, and you're have this medical device company. So go do that, and I'll be reasonable in my fees. But I think at the end of the day, doing what you do best is what's going to make the company progress and, and be success, successful. And you know, there are times where uh, you have to pay for certain things because you just don't have the expertise. And what I tell clients, startup clients, is get a good relationship with a business advisor. Get a good relationship with a lawyer and accountant because you're going to need them. And you have to trust and rely on them to a certain extent because you know the most valuable commodity we have is time. And if you're spending 10, 15, 20 hours a week on learning accounting, learning law, learning this other stuff, you're not doing what you should be doing for your um for your business and having done this thousands of times already I can tell you after my first couple phone calls with the client whether they're gonna cut it or not um, because I, I see we, what we type do, of mistakes we do turn down yeah. clients. Um, I see what mistakes they're making and what they're doing really well and you know I guide them because I've seen I've had clients that have that have had exits and I've had clients that just shut down shop uh, and a lot of times it's financial mismanagement it's not knowing the numbers it's giving away too much equity early on in the process. Everyone thinks that equity is an easy way to compensate people because you don't have cash, since cash is so scarce early on. So you're giving away 1% here, 2% here, 3% there. It all adds up, you know? Right. And, then you, and then you kind of sit down at the end of the day, left. you look at the cap table and you say, geez, I just gave away 25% of the company to people who may right. not be as driven as you are, um, who don't have the same vision, but just think to, them, to themselves like, oh, I, I got, you know, I own a company. Uh, I know the client in Fairfield, who has promised equity to one of his longtime clients, and for two or three years, the client's been phenomenal because he's just waiting for that equity chunk of the company. The company probably does 15, 20 million dollars a year. Young guy, 26, 27 years old, you know, probably wants to go to the bar and tell his friends that he owns, you know, 25% of this company that's 10, 15 million dollar revenue. We give him the equity, and then now it's like it just doesn't come to work. There's no incentive. No incentive anymore. And what I advised the client was, you know, attach a vesting schedule to this, right? right? So a term you may you may hear in this in this line is a, a vesting schedule with a cliff. Right. It's typically four years. The Silicon Valley standard is four years with a one-year cliff. So that means that if you leave before that first year is up, you get nothing at all. And, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a double incentive, too, because you as the employer want to make sure that the person that you're going to give the equity to is, is sticking around. And it's doing its, you know, doing his or her job. And there's many times where I've advised my corporate clients, will fire him on or her the last day before the, you know, the cliff, because then you've gotten the benefit of 364 days of work. You've only paid him or her whatever they're supposed to be paid, but you're not giving away a very valuable asset you have, which is the equity. And you know, they're fired like that. You, you may have employment issues. And there's no employment issue. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's also important on the same lines. Um, is that if you're applying a vesting schedule to everyone, you should apply it to yourself as well. I mean, you're not going to go anywhere, so you might as well not you know, take take the cash yourself. And it plus, it sets a good message for everyone else at the company. We're treating everyone equally. What do you do with voting rights? With what? With, with if the vesting? You're saying you're as a principal founder, and you're going to have a vesting schedule. You, are you still going to be exercising those votes, or will yeah, everyone would have the votes that they would get. You know, on a fully, fully diluted schedule uh, basis, yeah. Okay, so let's go to the next example. So this is Square. I don't know how many of you have heard about it, but you'll probably recognize the photo potentially, um, the little white little dongle thing. Uh, Square is a credit card processing company. Uh, the startup is now valued at five billion dollars, which is crazy. Um, the lawsuit concerns its signature project, a, a product, that little white thing. Um, it basically translates the information from their magnetic strips into uh, audio signals that a smartphone can understand, which is kind of fascinating, actually. Um, the reason why I wrote Beware of Your College Professors... It's a good life lesson. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, this is another situation with three people. Um, in early 2014, Wash U. Who is the first one to watch? Me. You. Yeah, okay. Are you Robert Morley? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. Okay, good. He changed his name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Robert Morley um, sued Square alleging patent infringement and breach of fiduciary duty. Morley claims that he, Jack Dorsey, you may have heard of him, he's the CEO of Twitter uh, and the CEO of Square, 
and James McClevey worked together in 2009 to figure out how to accept credit card payments through a mobile phone. Um, uh, Dorsey and McClevey actually sought out the college <coughs> professor for his advice and help, um, so be careful, um, about starting a new business. Then they ultimately decided to form a joint venture together. Morley alleged that he actually invented the hardware device that Square went on to use uh, as its co uh, credit card reader. And Morley alleged that they, the other co-founders, co took the information, created Square, cut him out of any ownership interest. And he actually patented the technology. So that's interesting. Um, Square said, well, uh, you wrongly left out McKelvey's name off of the patent. And Morley said, well, no, no, no. You went ahead and filed some additional patents that improperly incorporated my insights and methods. So there was a whole issue with the patent. Um, and he said, well, you know, I didn't have an ownership stake because I hoped to assign the control of the patent to Square in exchange for shares. That obviously never happened. So make sure that you have contracts written up early on and not say, oh, well, you know, it, it is my patent. Of course, I'm going to get an ownership share. Didn't happen. He settled for $50 million. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that the take from that uh, tidbit is intellectual property property early on in a startup's life is the most valuable asset that, that it has. And while you can ascribe a value to it, it's essentially worthless to everyone in the world other than you. To protect it, it's vital that you have um, take takes proper precautions. Let's take the Coca-Cola formula. The Coca-Cola formula. I think you know two or three people in the in the in the company in the world have access to portions of the formula. They're, what they're trying to do is protect it so that if someone were to leave leave the company and take what they knew about the formula, they couldn't go to Pepsi and sell that. So you know one person might know the first first third, the other person might know the second third, and the third third. The point there is you need to take the proper precautions against intellectual property. You need to have non-disclosure agreements. You can't go telling everyone about this great idea you have because once you've disclosed it to someone else, then you're losing what's called the common law protection of trade secrets. Uh, a trade secret is something that's valuable, um, uh, an idea, and you protect it by not disclosing to someone else. Uh, you know, the next protection for a trade secret is what would be a patent, right? You're, the purpose of a patent is to disclose your great idea to someone else, and in exchange for that, you get a certain monopoly over the product for a certain period of time, depending on the patent. Um, so when you when you retain an uh, an employee or a consultant or bring someone on, then it's 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 so important to have them sign and agree contractually not to disclose the information, not to use it for any other purpose other than to help you. And keep it under lock and key. Keep it in a secure, on a secure server so that it's if it's hacked, um, it's, it's not going to be taken and not going to be stolen. Um, and, uh, and 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 keep track of who has what and, and when you gave it to them. Because if there is an issue in any subsequent lawsuit, you can kind of have that to establish the protection of um, over, over the trade secret. There's been tons of lawsuits that I've been involved in where. Um, there has been an allegation of trade secret theft. For example, one of my first cases was a case in federal court in Manhattan. Uh, it was a three-week trial before a visiting judge from Seattle. I don't know if this is becoming a theme of Washington. Um, but what happened was my client had worked at a chemical manufacturer, and the defendant um, also worked at the same chemical manufacturer. They both left. One bought the technology. My client looked at patents and other publicly available information and came up with this technology. They both, sued, they both sued each other. And at the end of the day, we prevailed because in large part, the other side, which is a PhD chemist, kind of admitted on the stand to, to lying to the judge. I think during the trial, we're all sitting there and he's on the stand um, and he looks at the judge during a question and says, judge, you know, do I have to answer this question? And the judge goes, yes, you have to answer the question. You were just asked the question by your lawyer. And he goes, I don't want to answer this question, judge. And we're all kind of sitting there like, what's going on? And you know, I'm like tapping the, 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 the foot of my partner at the time. And uh, the PhD chemist goes, well, judge, I've been lying. And at that point, like, we're not moving. <laughs> what is happening? 
And he goes, but judge, nothing I've said today has been the truth. <laughs> and the judge goes, what do you mean? He's like, well, and he goes into this whole dialogue about how he's religious and you know, God just came to him and told him that he can't go on with this. So he says that, um, you know, we, we never stole the technology and, you know, Mr. Gore's client should win. And it's like out of a movie. You just never think that this would happen. So the judge goes, wait, let me get this straight. So your, all your allegations in this case are false. Yes. And you've lied to me on the stand all day. Yes. And the judge, is, judge says, well, you know, what are we doing here anymore? And it's one of these really awkward cases. It was a $55 million case. And, um, you know, we left that day and we had a nice dinner because there was no further, no further trial. But the point that we got from that is um, button up all of your agreements and um, how you treat what's the most important asset of the company, which is, might be code, it might be a formula, um, a process, something. Customer list, customer suppliers, list, yeah. marketing, strategies, business plans, those all come under, you wouldn't think, trade secrets. You might think, you know, Coca-Cola, sure, a formula, um, Google, their algorithm, uh, but you wouldn't think, oh, list of suppliers, customers, that kind of thing. So. Some tips, if you are the company, to protect your trade secrets would be, you know, pre-employment clearance. Um, make sure, find out if, if the person you're hiring has signed an, N, an NDA, non-disclosure agreement. Also find out um, if, you know, you don't want to necessarily target your competitors, employees, because then it seems like you're trying to obtain their trade secrets. So when you conduct a search to hire people, don't just look at your competitors. Um, just keep it broad. Another tip, we mentioned the uh, non-disclosure agreements. And then there's non-competition agreements as well. Um, those are generally enforceable by law, but there are two things that, that states tend to limit. It would be duration, so how long it's in effect, and then geographic scope. Um, so you might want to put one of those in place. And then, you know, employee education for everyone who's there. You want to put periodic reminders in your newsletters at company functions, mark, uh, marking documents confidential, using shredders, passwords, security codes, just so everyone is aware, hey, you know, this is very important information. We can't let this go out to the public. I've heard of companies putting, <laughs> like, weird signs in the kitchen with like a skull or you know just be like secret area just to kind of um remind people when i was working on i guess i can say now the Vioxx litigation when i was a paralegal in new york um early 2000s we we had the we couldn't say the name of the case we were working on uh we called it a specific name um, which I can't not reveal, <laughs> but we had, even within our law firm, we had separate conference rooms, which we worked out of that had a sign that said, project whatever, do not enter unless you're an approved um, person at the firm. So just, just make sure everyone's aware. And then, you know, if you're a startup and you're already working for a business and you want to take, not necessarily take some of that information, but you want to branch out on your own, uh, a couple tips are, you know, use public domain information such, such as expired patents. Um, use different suppliers. Approach different customers. Try to do your own thing as much as possible. Um, you know, I, I've represented a lot of founders and startups. Um, the one common thread that I've noticed through all of the, the founders is a lot of them are just paranoid. And paranoid is, is a good thing. They, they question every decision that they make. Um, they look at financials, you know, upside, downside, left side, right side, just to make sure that everything's making sense. Because the last thing you need is bad information. Um, they they protect all of their information at, at all costs. They have double, triple passwords. They have two layers of, of security and protection on their emails, on their on, on their devices. They make sure that um, any employee or consultants that have phones that they have access to the phones so that they can wipe them clean if they ever lose it. Um, uh, you know, things that just make sense in hindsight after you lose something. I, re I remember about a year ago, you know, I was out at an event and I lost my phone. And, you know, my primary concern was, well, I have attorney-client privilege information on there. And if that ever gets out, then I could lose my license. And, you know, I took that seriously. So I had in place, you know, a two-step verification process. I was able to wipe my phone clean. But it is a hassle. You have to think of it the same way for all your, all of your information. Just as if you wouldn't want to... Um, you know, lose a, a paper the night before it's due. You just want to protect and back up everything. 
Um, you know, uh, founders in my experience are um, very driven. They are up late at night every every night, and they're thinking about everything. They're thinking about how to grow the business. They're thinking about what better process to put in place. If you watch um, um, Shark Tank, right? Or, I'm sure you guys watch Shark Tank, right? Yeah. Or that, uh, what's the other show with? Um, oh, The Profit. The Profit, right? That comes after show. Shark Tank. <laughs> I actually have one client of mine. Uh, there's another. There's going to. I can't mention the show. But there's a show that's being created by a competing network that's going to compete with Shark Tank, and one of my startup clients is going to be on the on the um, on the first episode. So that's really cool. But um, thinking about that and seeing the contract between my client and this new TV series is interesting because everyone wants equity in these startups. Everyone wants a piece of the startup, which is why I accept equity for in exchange for compensation. But um, when they go on these shows, they're giving up a lot of equity. They're mm -hmm. they're giving up a lot of rights early on, usually for a period of a year. Because they know that the press they get from going on Shark Tank or the Profit or this new show that's going to come out it's soon, priceless. priceless. Yeah. Um, so thinking about ways to, to, to market your business uh, is something that you know I have constant discussions with my clients, and you know my our role as uh, legal counsel to startups and founders is not limited to what the law is because a lot of this stuff is multifaceted. Yeah, a lot of the yeah. stuff that we went over today, you know, we can just we've said it so many times. It's like a broken record for us because. Essentially, what we've done today is what I, you know, the conversation I have with my clients early on the process because I want everyone to know this. But our role is not limited just to the legal risk. There's the business risk. There's the financial risk. There's the security risks. Um, there's growing the business. There's, you know, I, I've uh, we've talked to so many businesses. We've seen what's gone wrong, what's gone right. It's important that you know what I know. Um, so that's why I think finding a good legal advisor or a good business advisors important because they offer the, the wealth of information that you don't have. You know, we've done this thousands of times. An investor has invested or seen pitches by hundreds of, if not thousands of founders. So right off the bat, they can tell you whether this is going to be a good presentation or a bad presentation. When I see a pitch deck come through my email, I don't have to go to the third page. I can tell you after the second page whether it's something that I'm going to be interested in or if it's something that's done right or done well um, because I've picked up on things that you know, common mistakes, misspellings, um, you know, getting the name of the company right is, I've seen that mistake happen too often. Um, you know, laying out your strategy, laying out the exit strategy. Investors want to know how you, investors want to know that you're thinking about how to get them out, how to monetize their investment, monetize their investment. Sure, we all want the money from the investor to come in because we want to grow the business, but the investor's thinking, well, great, I'm going to give you $500,000, million, millions of dollars, but how are you going to get that money back for me and in what, in, in, in what period? So you may not need to have the most clearest direction for that, but they just want to know that you're thinking about that. There's many times where I'll prep a client when they're going into an investor pitch, and I ask them about the edge strategy. They, it's just something that never comes to mind because, again, think, you know, your startup is your startup. Right, they're not thinking about the end. Yeah. They're thinking about just the beginning. Beginning, right? And you're thinking about how to grow it and how to make yourself successful, getting a nice payday for you. And if you lose sight of the investor, then you're kind of losing sight of the whole process because I always tell clients, once you get third-party money into the company, the ball game changes. Then you really need to comply with all the laws. Then you really need to paper everything up. Then you really need a lawyer at every step. Then you really need to not lie. Then you really need to not misrepresent facts, right? You can get away with what we call puffery, uh, misleading stuff. Yeah, I'm, I, this business is great. Um, we did $100,000 of sales last, last year, right? The latter would be something that you can get sued for, whereas the first, uh, the former, you couldn't, you couldn't get sued. Um, so, you know, I started this little diatribe by saying that founders are paranoid, and they're paranoid because they want to say the right thing to the right person at the right time. And they want to be able to know, you know, everything about the company, the financial picture, um, the, the marketing picture, the client picture, who's working, what, when, where, how, and why. And a lot of times when I advise clients who haven't done this before, which is a lot of them, um, it, it's it's really earth shattering to them to, to understand and fully comprehend what they need to do and what they don't need to do. Um, so I would just say learn as much as you possibly can. Um, writing is beyond important. You know, one thing that I'll see in a pitch deck if there's not complete sentences or improper grammar, you're going to lose an investor just like that. You could have spent hundreds and hundreds of hours doing a pitch deck, but if you get 
a misplaced comma, a misplaced period, something that's just so simple, you're going to lose that investor, and it's not worth it. Um, we're, we're at the hour, so I wanted to open it up to questions. If we don't have questions, I can still go through some more slides. Go ahead. I'm here to talk about uh, exit strategies. Do you think, like off the top of your head, maybe some industries that you wouldn't really necessarily think that would need an exit strategy? Like, because I'm, I'm thinking of uh, kind of like real estate. Like, I know that like my um, the company that I um, um, help my dad out with, uh, we use a lot of sometimes investor money when we can't. Like afford some of it, and the investor wants to know like what kind of house it is, like all this stuff, and usually it's done by phone. You know I mean, building that trust. Um, he's associated with one guy that's really he's been using a lot, but he's never really asked about like an exit strategy. It's just your house, like a house, basically. Yeah, I mean that's <laughs> that's the best exception is real estate. Um, if a real estate real estate investors are going to want uh, the income. I'm sure you pay. Uh, you know, if there's rental, that there's some sort of payment monthly or yearly, that type of investor is going to want the return on their investment, which would be a chunk of the rental income that comes in monthly. And if there's a sale, then whatever profit comes in. So, you know, I think the exit in your situation is more of the, the monthly income that comes in for from rent, uh, and when the the property is eventually sold. Yeah, the way the way that he actually does it is he tries to uh, limit that with his rentals, so that like when he does it, he's chasing the sale. Basically, you're chasing to sell one foot. You know, you want to get that done yeah. in a certain amount of time. But that's residual, that type of income. That's what we want, like ourselves. So it kind of varies. Well. Yeah, it's yeah. interesting that about the exit strategy is something I use and apply to try to go on a daily basis. Yeah, it's it's very important. Um, and then I, you know, I just noted here talking. This is more talking about venture capitalists, but they're not interested unless the expected return is in the range of thirty-five percent to forty-five percent compounded annually. So it just gives you a, an idea of what they're expecting. Um, yeah, so what I'm wondering is, I know you mentioned that um, often with startups, you sort of have to take equity as a form of payment. But um, the thing is, I mean, at a certain point, like, I mean, you guys have your bills too, whether it's law school, loans, or rent, other things. I'm, I'm sort of like, like, where do you, do you have like a measure of like what percent of your clients will take equity from? Or like, how do you go about determining that? I usually determine it if I think it's a good idea. If I think there's going to be success there, then I'll say sure, I'll take equity. But um, you know, or you not, not, jelly sandwiches. yeah, nine point nine out of ten times I won't take it because I just I don't have faith in the founders. I don't have faith in the product. And it takes away time from your other yeah. pain. Is it, is it almost always offered before they you know before you negotiate no. payment? No, it's sometimes not. they don't even think about it. Yeah, I mean, I, I would I've been probably offered it um, twenty to thirty percent of the time, um, and. The reason why I at least have that discussion with them is because I know that they're thinking about ways to make, um, you know, to decrease cash flow so that they can have someone on board for a longer period of time that's invested, right? There's always a vesting schedule applied to whenever I receive it because they want to make sure that I am not going to kind of jump ship and kind of retain that equity. And, you know, when, when I take equity, I want to make sure that it it's it's a success because all I've given is time, and at the end of the day, if this pans out, then I'll get a nice check, and all I've kind of lost is my time, which is not bad. Uh, well, how, <laughs> <laughs> how we've often structured it is, you know, because obviously startups don't have the cash, if, if any, is we'll say, okay, we'll draft all these documents for you, and then you know you can pay us back after the seed round or oh, yeah. at a later round of financing. If you don't have the money now, it'll be like an IOU. That's how we do it because, well, we take on startup clients because we find it an exciting field. So we do it for not just for the money. We do it because we're we like the idea and we think it's going to be successful. Um, this shift in topics about the I thought it was pretty unique about your situation with kind of like intellectual property rights. Now with some of these big like businesses that you've been associated with, have you ever came across like um, when they're doing operations in a different company? A country and they actually steal the, the property rights. There's like really nothing you can do about that. We're like, it, it's oh. funny you mention that because one of our big cases right now, we represent a, um, I don't want to say the country, what they do, but we, we represent a, a manufacturer of product that's based in um, Australia, we can say that. <laughs> and we filed a lawsuit in New York against the, the number one leader in, in, in the industry. And uh, the products are sold throughout the world, 
and um, you know our lawsuit is limited to United States stuff. But at the end of the day, what happened is there was a theft of a design of a product, and the competitor has used it throughout the, throughout the, throughout the U.S. and throughout the world. And going through and having the discussion with the client, United States intellectual property law is very strong, but there's so many times where we'll use the manufacturer that we have based in China and you know they'll produce 10 of these products and off the line nine go to one box and one go to the other box which is then sold through the back channels on an international scale it's important for you to to, to recognize that the ip rights aren't going to be that strong in you know non-developed countries um, but you can still file for international patents and you can have them linked together just so that you have the protection in the, the more developed countries. But then that that raises a huge issue when you are doing business like in like globally because everybody on the index is like America I think is actually 7.7 like because it's changing every day. That's pretty high since we're not top 10 we're like top 15 or 7.7 .7 on the chart. But like 8.4 is like the highest. But then there's countries like Venezuela that's down to like 2.7. That's out of 128 countries. Um, now there's like really nothing we knew about that because the U.S. loses 80 billion a year on intellectual property rights, which I find fascinating. Um, 80 billion. That's pretty much one third of all American exports being lost. The bottom line revenues of American companies, and that's something that I feel like maybe like since like all this like globalization and integration of all these economies are being taken place. There should be kind of some kind of stipulation for something happening along those lines. And like, do you see like maybe in the future of being able to? You don't. No, I That's mean, crazy because there's treaties, but there's no like, there's no, there's no enforcement. And, there's no enforcement. Yes, and, and I, I can tell you, I represented this, this one of the um, one of the pioneers of Bitcoin. I represent one of the founder, the, the pioneers of Bitcoin, and. What he was trying to do was mine Bitcoin, so he was going to create all these supercomputers, and he bought, you know, twenty thousand dollar processors. He bought hundreds of them, and before I got involved, he made the mistake of shipping them by sea to China, and um, he had he got an insurance policy, didn't cover it, and then they just disappeared, um, and someone else used them. But you know, it costs so much to litigate in the United States, where we have a, you know. A, a good system, um, but just imagine trying to litigate IP issues in state in, in countries that just don't respect the IP. Uh, I advise clients as we deal with these issues, it's just not worth your time, right? Um, you're not going to get anything. You're not going to be able to enforce it. It's going to cost you a whole bunch of money, and at the end of the day, you're not going to get the, the, the relief or remedy that you want. In the U.S., you have to protect your IP. If you if you have a a, um, a trademark, a trade dress, a copyright, or a patent, and you find out that others are using it. You actually have an affirmative obligation to go out there and cause cause a cause a problem. Send a cease and desist letter. Mm -hmm. If it's really egregious, then file a lawsuit. Because if you don't do that, then all of your hard work goes down the drain. Because right. there How is there is a risk that by not enforcing it, not policing your own IP, you will lose it as a matter of law by not suing them, by not sending a cease and desist letter, um, not kind of negotiating licenses here and there. So you know, in the U.S., whomever you use as a as an advisor will will. will uh, advise you on that, but internationally, I mean, it's a different ballgame. It really is the wild, wild west. Depends on the state, the jurisdiction, mm -hmm. what their IP laws are, and, and you know, if you want to really pay for probably just one country, it may not be worth your business. Um, and the, you may not know who to sue. Right? Yeah, you may not know <laughs> who to sue. Just things that you can come up with an idea online, take and literally yeah. and just reproduce, and reproduce. Yeah. So that what can happen. And I mean, I'm for like. Uh, like tighten down on that, but like globally, the WTO is doing really nothing about it. There's treaties. Yeah, I mean they have no power. I have another client yeah. who, um, there's supposedly on the on the dark web this list of like the, the 20 best hackers in the world. Mm -hmm. So one of my clients hired like the number five best hacker, okay, <laughs> like on this list. And what 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 my client wanted is to create a technology that allows phones. Or you know other electronics to communicate with each other in an encrypted way. That's not something that are, that exists right now. I think that's all I can just say. Um, so all the right documents were signed. This is going to be your situation. All the right documents were signed. We got them to agree to everything. Everything was assigned to the company. We had access to his email. We had access to the code. Access to everything, right? But this guy's the fifth best hacker in the world. 
So he leaves Silicon Valley, goes to, I think, Croatia, um, and then we can't get into our code, we can't get into our email, we don't know where anything is, right? And now he has this great idea in all the code. And we had long calls with board members in Hawaii and um, Vietnam, uh, Dubai, all over the world, because we didn't know what to do. Um, you know, the fifth best hacker in the world has our stuff. Um, and he's the one who went on vacation. Yeah, this guy, yeah. he went on vacation, right? He went on vacation. And then, and then just on vacation. And then, and then return. Um, <laughs> you know, so we kind of lost that, but we were able to come to a, to a good resolution. Um, he gave us a version of the code, whatever that means. Um, you know, and we're stuck now trying to rebuild something that we don't even know what he was doing because no one's as good as he is. Um, so that kind of goes back to the trust issue and, and getting everything papered and, and ensuring that you have the password to everything and that someone that comes in that you think you trust isn't spy and just takes it from you. Right. What if you got the fourth best hacker? Yeah. <laughs> you couldn't find him. <laughs> Unless it's you. Uh, as far as ownership interests, would you say it's more important to maintain a large percentage, or would it be more important to maintain control through a contractual arrangement? So in other words, it's okay to own 40% as long as you have a contractual arrangement that ensures you control. There are many times where I will advise clients to um, you know, obtain a, an irrevocable proxy, which is getting the right to vote shares a certain way, or entering into a stockholders agreement where everyone agrees that they will vote alongside someone. I think at the end of the day, those contractual provisions are contracts and people will break them. And if they're broken, then, the, then there needs to be a lawsuit. And the lawsuit gets really expensive. And the one that really makes money there is me. And I, I, I never really advise clients to enter into lawsuits unless it's something that is really, really necessary. So you know, the direct answer to your question is I would rather have voting control than you know, by virtue of holding on to stock ownership mm -hmm. as opposed to doling out contractual rights where you may get a smart lawyer who can exploit a loophole and then instead of having control, you have a malpractice lawsuit, which is not worth it either. And one other question, we heard, uh, we didn't hear your educational background. Oh, <laughs> right, so I went to Quinnipiac undergrad and I graduated in 2003. I had a, um, I majored in political science and economics. And then I went to law school at Quinnipiac as well, and I graduated in 2006, and then worked for 10 years at uh, one of the best firms in the state. And then at the end of 2014, um, a private equity venture capital um, client asked me to start my own firm. Um, and that's what I've been doing since. And would you say, how would you rate the value of your edu education, particularly the economics component? You know, I, I <laughs> a loaded question. <laughs> Didn't expect this one. So, um, you know, because I do a lot of because we do a lot of business work, a lot of securities work, a lot of um, advising startups and businesses, it is vitally important that we understand both the legal aspects of the advice as well as the business aspects, and that's comes down to economics, accounting, finances, um, um, financial statements just understanding inside and out more than our clients. I mean, at some point, a long-term client is going to get more knowledgeable about its business than, than, than I will be. But I think, you know, if if Vanessa came to me tomorrow and says, you know, I want to start a company, um, I'm going to say, well, what type of company, what's it going to do? And she'll tell me. But I can tell you that I will know more about your business than you do at that point. <laughs> And that's because I have the finance, the finance background, so I have the economics background, the accounting background. Um, I understand how to read financial statements. I mean, that's all the language of startups. Imagine you have to give a presentation between a private equity fund that manages billions and billions of dollars, and they see hundreds and hundreds of pitches from people just like you every single day. They know the language. Um, they know what terms you should be using. If you don't have those terms down packed, then you're going to give yourself up. Um, just like you guys don't know if I, with what I'm telling you is true because you know you don't have the legal background that I have. I could have told you exactly everything exactly wrong. That's why I say yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, legal supervisor. Yeah, legal supervisor here. Um, so that you know, it's it's just so important to have a well-rounded education. I think the business yeah. aspect shows both from a from a lawyer perspective and a business perspective. I can tell you that 
at least in my practice, um, you know, lawyers need to have an understanding of finance, accounting, and economics because we, we speak the language of business every day. I mean, CNBC is on in my office all day long, and so is Bloomberg, just because I need to know all that stuff. It's how I knew Snapchat just when it's going public or doing what it needs to, to go public because these are conversations that I have, and knowing about the market, knowing what terms are, are market terms, knowing what type of equity is given to certain types of people within the corporate structure is important for me to know, and you know, being able to speak that language um, is, I mean, it, it will expose you. So uh, we have time for two more questions, just to wrap it up. Go ahead. Um, yeah, so I'm just wondering, um, I'm sure you guys work with a lot of clients. Do you think, um, do you find any difference, you know, as far as working with them? I don't know if it'd be more or less difficult to work with them if your clients themselves have a JD. <laughs> helpful and not helpful. Every client of mine thinks that they're a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you have someone that you talk to who wants a JV, and, and those conversations are a lot more lengthy. So, <laughs> because they're going through the ins and outs, and well, what if this happens, and what if that happens? So um, sometimes it can be a, a, a bigger time burden if you have someone with a with a JV. Um, but at the same time, on the opposite, you can streamline the process because you don't have to explain everything to them. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, Rich, you want to speak on that? I mean, I can just tell you that, you know, business people just want the answer. They want the solution. Uh, if you're talking to a CEO of the company, he just doesn't have the time, so he wants to know if there's a problem, tell him how to fix it. Um, one of the best pieces of advice that I received as a first-year lawyer um, was from a partner at one of the other biggest firms in the state. We were out at a bar association event. And we were just talking, and she said, um, you know, Rich, let me just tell you something that I've been told early on in my career, and I think it worked out well. If you ever have an issue or a problem, like, don't go to your boss and say, I just found this out. Because then the, the follow-up question is going to be, well, what do we do about it? And in business, what I've learned, and teaching and advising clients is, the solution is always more important than the problem. Because you, you want to reduce the anxiety and the stress of your clients and, and your employees and, and yourself. And if you can problem solve and be... Um, uh, proactive about issues and not cause, not create a mountain out of a molehill. Um, that's just super important. And I think lawyers more often than not want to kind of talk through everything to kind of get to the right answer. Whereas business people will be like, okay, great. You know, there's a hundred thousand dollars missing from the bank account. What do we do? It's the, what do we do that we, that, that is, is most important. Instead of a theoretical decision, yeah. discussion. And um, do you find that your clients with law degrees, do you find that their ventures tend to be more successful? No. no. <laughs> Just not a successful there's, at all. There's no correlation. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Well, thank you so much for having me.